Welcome to the Inertia Podcast, where we talk with personalities from the worlds of surf and snow. These are casual conversations where we get real with impactful humans, because getting real still matters. I'm here because I really enjoy this. I'm motivated by the mountains. I'm motivated by the challenge. And I really like the practice of learning. And so I want to like express that to other people. To know Cody Townsend is to truly know a modern explorer and a down-to-earth one at that. If you hadn't heard, Cody is in the middle of an epic project, The 50, where he's attempting to write all the lines in the book, The 50 Classic Ski Descents of North America. The longtime free skier, who starred in hugely influential movies like Days of My Youth, started a vlog to document the project. But something crazy happened as he moved through the 50. The YouTube channel's popularity grew, not because of his audacious descents, which were notable, but because of his relatable personality. Cody brings it in a way skiers, snowboarders, and even non-mountain people can relate to. We talked with Cody about the project's success, if he can finish it, and balancing danger with fatherhood. The Inertia Podcast is sponsored by Decked. Decked makes products that turn your pickup truck or van bed into a mobile gear command center. If you like knowing your gear is right there where you actually need it, secure, out of the elements, and ready to go, then Decked is worth checking out. They bring peace to your truck bed chaos with two full bed length storage drawers that slide out at waist height, allowing easy access to tools and gear for any adventure in the wild. Imagine industrial dresser drawers in your truck bed. The deck drawer system also gives you the perfect platform for securing large items like coolers and surfboards or just a place to sleep. They've got a no BS lifetime warranty, so check it out. Get your truck dialed today at decked.com. All right, Cody Townsend. I want to say legendary free skier. Uh, Cody, thank you for joining us here at the Inertia. I just uh, want to tell you I have loved everything you've done with the 50 Project. And I just want to kind of start there, if you don't mind, if you could just kind of, I know I think you're on 43 of 50. You, you posted 43 of 50, so we're looking for 44 next. Uh, can you possibly catch us up and get us up to speed on, on where you're at with the 50 Project? Yeah, well, first I got to take issue with your first statement. I mean, legend is just a code word for old, which I am old <laughs> at this point. No, no. Um, the other part, uh, you know, it's funny. I people kind of starting to know me as like a ski mountaineer, and I've always, to me, I'm just a skier. And uh, being growing up as a ski racer to being a big mountain skier, free skier, skiing in the park a little bit to what I do now, backcountry skiing and more ski mountaineering. I've always just. Uh, said I'm a skier and uh, it's been pretty cool because now I'm 40 years old and I still feel like I'm learning and exploring the mountains in a whole new way, which bringing you to the second question, the 50. Um, yeah, I mean, I'm working on it right now. I'm not gonna totally spoil uh, spoil the soup by uh, letting people know, but um, all I will say, yeah, there's seven left, um, but they're a hard seven. Um, who knows how long it'll take for me to finish them or if I finish at all. I have no idea. Um, you know, as I said in the very first episode, it was about trying and that's all I'm going to do, um, is going to try every line and try every line in the book and, you know, make a decision from there, see where my heart is, see where my mind is, family life, context, all that kind of stuff will decide whether I finish or not. Um, I don't know. I have literally no idea. Um, yeah, I hear you. I mean, just for context here, when Cody references the book, it's uh, the 50 Project actually came out of the 50 Greatest Descents of North America. Um, I think I have that title right. Correct me if I'm wrong. Yeah, it was the 50 Classic Ski Descents of North America, which is like kind of a – it's a – very debated word because what does classic mm. mean and like certain lines within the book are are legit classics let's say like uh mount shasta that's a line that tons of people and go ski like it's just uh it was a thing that i dreamed of before i got into ski touring i'm like one day i'm gonna hike up mount shasta and ski seven thousand vert of corn that's like kind of a classic but then there's other lines in there that you're like well they're deep they're hard they're suffering um they rarely get skied is that a classic i don't know um so the the word classic is an interesting one it'd be like you know 
uh, trying to frame it in like surfing as being like, well, like Malibu, that's a classic surf break. But is like, is Chopu a classic surf break? You know, some of the hardest in the men in the world and women in the world go charge it. But I don't know. I would never consider surfing it. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah, like pipe or something. I think maybe in mountain biking, you could say, oh, that's a classic trail. But is it for a classic trail for everybody? Yeah. You know, you think of classic trails as smooth, single track, but if there's a drop or two in, then maybe that takes out. I don't know. I, I see where you're getting. What 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 descents do you have left, if you don't mind, of the, uh, the seven descents left? <clears throat> yeah, so we've got the the three cruxes, in my opinion. So Mount St. Elias, uh, University Peak, and Mount Robson, the north face of Mount Robson. Uh, the Comstock, which we tried last year, um, got turned around on. Uh, Split Mountain in California. And then... Bad Polar Star in Baffin, and then Bloody Mountain. Although blood, Bloody Kular off Bloody Mountain, I'm, I don't spoil it then. It, I skied it when I was 18. I've skied it actually like six or seven times. It's a legit classic. I just haven't done an episode on it, nor kind of ticked it off for this project per se. But yeah, I skied it for the first time probably when I was like 18 or so. So long time ago. So are you surprised a bit by like I am like I, I I mentioned this earlier I and we'll talk to people that you know barely ski or no skiing kind of as an as an outside thing to that to their world um, and friends will say have you watched this guy Cody Townsend is freaky and are I'm I that kind of catches me off guard I've had that happen a couple times I'm like yeah I actually see, I'm running I know Cody he's, he's a good guy man he's I'm, I'm, I'm honored to be able to like say I know him, you know, because that's like, that's kind of where you start to break through. Are you surprised at all? You know, you're about 175K subscribers. Like this has gotten pretty popular. Did that, did that kind of catch you off guard or, or how to? Yeah. I mean, the level of popularity that has come from it has definitely caught me off guard. Um, you know, like I, I once had a viral moment and was on like Sports Center and, you know, just the full virality of what goes across all news media. And like, so I know what was that, that, kind that of, shoot. Yeah, the, the crack. The, yeah. And so I kind of yeah. know what that feels like. And it was like mayhem for um, six months or so. I mean, for a week, it was mayhem. And then people are always coming up to you and you can't walk through an airport. But like the 50 has been kind of like that, but every day. And I'm like, this is kind of crazy. But I will say it starts, I think, back to why I framed the media portion of the way I wanted to do is like when I started backcountry skiing and skiing like objective lines and going on expeditions, what I found really, really fascinating was everything that went into it, not the actual skiing itself. And so when I was like crafting how I wanted this, the stories to be told, I've been pitching it to sponsors, I was telling them, I'm like, it's going to be like 80% not skiing. It's everything that goes into it. And now all the decision making, all the prep, all the planning, all the research, those critical points within a day where you're making a decision, whether you keep going or turn around or have to change your route or whatever it is. And, and then there's a little bonus on top that when you summit and ski the line. And what I think why it's kind of become so popular is because that's relatable. Like it's a human story. It's not just like ski porn. It's not just like doing tricks on skis or skiing lines, badass, which you kind of have to be an educated viewer to understand the level of difficulty that goes into that stuff. Um, so I think just like that was like a happy coincidence that what I found fascinating, I think is what's relatable to so many people. And I think that's why it's been approachable by non skiers. Um, I mean, I've been kind of blown away by how many people tell me like, you know, I'd never back entry skied. I, I, I took my first Abbey class. I did a mountaineering class and now I've got a mentor and I'm starting to get into it because of this project, which is, which is really cool. I mean, that's like, if you can have that sort of impact, I think that's like the one positive impact I feel like I can have on people and on viewers um, for a project that, and a career that, you know, as a professional athlete there, it's an inherently selfish career. You're, you're chasing your own dreams and whatnot. And luckily people uh, 
find you valuable enough to, to fund you while doing that. So with this project, the fact that more people are becoming educated about the backcountry, they're doing it the right way, they're seeing the way pros make decisions, get scared, turn around, uh, do avalanche courses, understand kind of the research that goes into it and taking this process of learning back and skiing is a very slow process, I think has been kind of a, the most positive thing for myself. Um, I think it's like the thing I'm most proud of and definitely something I didn't go set off to do. It just kind of naturally happened. I mean, how much do you think of that as, as your personality? You're very approachable though. You're not like, I don't know, gnarly bro. Like, <laughs> I don't know. I feel like that sells it as much as anything. Yeah, I mean, I was influenced, obviously, like my parents were a big part of that, of just being as a kid and, you know, teaching me to, as my mom would always say, you, you know, if someone comes up to you and say, says hi, don't just say hi. She would always say hi and a sentence. And so I would always like engage with people. And so I think I got comfortable talking with people from a very young age. And then also I look to like my heroes within this sport, uh, specifically someone like Shane McConkey, someone that never took himself that seriously, that never lost the root of why he was doing this, which was for fun. Like we do these sports because they give us some sort of enjoyment. You know, there's other reasons potentially, whether that's connection to nature, whether that's community, whether that's even exercise, but ultimately like those all kind of come back to some form of happiness and fun. And so I've like always want to make sure that I am translating that even when we're suffering, even when it's really hard or scary that like, hey, we're doing this for fun. Like, I'm not doing this to prove anything to the world. I'm not doing this to like put my name on the upper echelons or anything like this. Like, I'm here because I really enjoy this. I'm motivated by the mountains. I'm motivated by the challenge. And I really like the practice of learning. And so I want to like express that to other people that like, we, we ain't changing the world here. Like if somehow I do finish this, so like, wow, like there's a few headlines and then it's gone. Like, I don't care. It's like, if I enjoyed the process, then, then amazing. Then I've created a lot of great memories for myself, for an audience and contributed something to ski culture in general. Whereas if I was just going for like, just to tick it off and just trying to do it, I just feel like the, the, the purpose there would be missing for myself. Yeah, and there's there's an element too, I think, of the suffer that people can s seemingly relate to. I mean, you look at a mountain like you know Superior, you drive up the Lacatlan Canyon, it's right there. There's no approach; it's easy. You can tick that one off. That was a great episode, by the way, because you guys caught it in such good conditions too. Yes. But uh, what you know, how much is it breathing into that that suffer? It seems like you've done a ton of that in in this whole process <laughs> it's just like and i maybe that's part of it too you know examining the, the popularity of this youtube channel that you've created like does, does, does you really have to kind of just prepare for that stuff or i know you and michelle parker did that bike project too which was this little side almost a side project to the 50 so you're definitely uh not averse to suffering no. Um, well, I've learned, you know, it goes back to fun. And we in this world have three types of fun that we list. And there's type one fun, which is fun while you do it. It's powder skiing. It's just like hooting and hollering with your buddies. Uh, and then there's type two fun, which is it's fun after you do it. Like while you're doing it, you're not necessarily having fun. But man, for some reason, it all flips when you're done. You're just like, that is, that was incredible. That was such a amazing amount of fun. And then type three fun is like you, you, you didn't have fun during it. You didn't even have fun after it, but you're sort of thankful that you at least did it. But it's generally type three fun is like full epicing and you are on the edge of full catastrophe and you don't really want to have type three fun, but you're kind of still like a little twinge of like, I would never do that again. But yeah, I'm, I'm glad we tried and I'm glad we survived. So the, the type two fun to me is something I've learned to enjoy when I was younger. Like, I mean, I didn't really start ski touring until eight years ago. Um, I was a type one fun kind of guy, um, flying in helicopters and using snowmobiles and jumping off cliffs and skiing pow. Um, and <clears throat> when I first started kind of touring, I was like, this sucks. Like my legs are tired. I can't ski as well. And then you slowly start to shift and you start to like feel that feeling at the end of an epic day, at the end of a suffer. And you're like, wow, 
that's incredible. Um, funny thing is like still go suffer. And I don't think about like, well, this will be fun when it's over. Cause you're like, you're still, you're like, no, well, I'm suffering now. This sucks. But uh, I've learned to appreciate it. And I, I kind of just, I don't know. There's something I like the challenge of it. I like to figure out to be like, I look at something stupid, like riding your bikes with all your stuff loaded into it. So like a hundred pound bikes for a thousand miles to go climb and ski three mountains. And I look at that and I think about it and go like, could I do that? And then I try. So yeah, that's, that's the story. <laughs> because it's there. Yeah. yeah. Um, how has this changed? I mean, in the middle of all this, you know, a project like this, you can't just not something you can do in a year or two years or three. It's been going for some time. And in that t- time frame, you and, you know, your partner at least have had a child. How how is that sort of? I mean, I imagine that has changed things quite quite a bit. Yeah, I mean, it's definitely changed things a lot. Um, in mainly in the terms, like the first term that everyone actually thinks about is risk, and that actually hasn't changed that much because I think it's you know having lost a lot of friends to this sport, a lot of heroes, just seen you know twenty plus friends that I've been in the mountains with and or close friends die in this sport. So it was like a goal of mine a long time ago. Like your new goal is not to become a pro skier, not to be doing all these top things. It's to like, don't die is number one goal. And then number two goal is to do these things. So like my risk analysis, I'm like, I generally find that pretty conservative in nature. Um, And so even before a child, I felt like that that kind of pressure and that goal of like, hey, number one goal is don't die. Um, So I can't say it's changed my decision making that much, but where it has is just like the balance, Um, taking care of a kid. Um, Last year, having a kid for the first time, I've really got no training in before the season because you are full, full time with an, you know, an absolute infant and you're not sleeping at all and you're just trying to take care of it. And then the second year, which is we finally got some time. Um, my wife and I started with childcare and it's amazing. We have some free time. But then you realize that your children and childcare is pretty much their little, the cutest little Petri dish you've ever had. So I've been sick for like four months with just new sicknesses every other week. It's been brutal. But um, but other than that, like, I will say, like, the other thing is, like, I just want to spend more time with my kid, too. Like, priorities change. Like, I love my kid more than anything. It's incredible, the, the draw that your own child has and just, like, the feeling of getting a hug from him, watching him learn. It's just, like, it's it's on the exact same tier of the best moments I've ever had in the mountains when you're like kid hugs you, but it's like the same tree, but a different branch, but it's on that same level. And it's, it's awesome. Like, you know, I, on the weekends when we don't have childcare, I'm like, I'm not skiing. I want to hang out with my kid. We're going to go do stuff. And so there's that too. And priorities change in life. And, you know, having done this for so long, um, that I'm, that's like a balance I'm, want to have is being there for my family, being there for my child. So, um, yeah, it makes the project harder for sure. Um, you know, this year I was supporting my wife while she was doing, producing her own film projects. I was traveling around with her, not training, being like daddy daycare, helping her out with her production and whatnot. But that's like, that's what I want to do. Like I, you know, wouldn't have it any other way because I love my family. And so sure makes the 50 harder, but whatever. Yeah, they're only kids once. They're only four, they, once they hit that five year old mark. You know, it's it's a different ball game. So, totally. Yeah. Um, and you guys were in your like they were filming in Europe a lot, right? Where you guys spent quite a bit of time over there. Yeah, we filmed in Palisades Tahoe for like uh, about almost a, like three weeks. Um, and so and her and her co-producer and co-star Jackie Peso and her husband, Raina Barker, Ed, mm-hmm. who are all professional skiers, were at our house. And so um, we the, the guys were playing support. I was actually filming them a lot on the other side of the camera, which was pretty fun. Um, and then uh, we went Have to Switzerland. Have you done that before? 
Yeah. I mean, just with the project in general, um, I just okay. you know how to do it and you learn it. Um, so I was actually doing all of the GoPro follow cams um, and we'd just go out for a full day and I just filmed them go, you know, trying to jump off the same cliffs that they were doing. And it was actually, it was quite fun. I really enjoyed that side, the aspect of it. And then we went to Switzerland for about three and a half weeks to film again for their project. So um, it's been, you know, my project, like, the thing is most of the lines are spring lines in general when the snow starts to stabilize a bit more that spring wet warm snow sticks to the steep so i wasn't really forecasting skiing anything until march and end of march april anyways so mine my my season is just getting started yeah i mean and did you the season in tahoe insane i had to ask you before, did you get some i mean that was probably made it a little easier to be at home with the kid because you could get out for a quick lap there crystal or wherever you know like was it just how was it oh, it was do that? insane it was such a good i mean it was a lot of work um i've a few broken shovels my back's definitely extra tired um <laughs> had to spend quite a lot of extra money on getting help shoveling roofs and getting snow plows in and um but it was well worth it and it was a great year to be home a lot i definitely I had by far the deepest day I've ever had in Tahoe and one of the top three to five deepest days of my life. Um, yeah. We just don't get that kind of snow here often. I mean, it snowed six feet in 48 hours of absolutely below her pow. It was absolutely incredible. So in that regard, like it was the best year to be stuck at home essentially. And uh, yeah, I, I skied a lot of really good snow this year. It was awesome. I wanted to, I mean, a lot of people probably want to ask you this, but and I know it's probably hard to pinpoint having done 43 of those descents just to get, get back to this a little bit, but what, is there kind of an anecdote or a story you could give us kind of on the, maybe the gnarliest situation you found yourself in? Cause that is a lot of descents to do and not have anything go wrong. Like when you said you have, you take kind of a conservative approach to decision-making, which I think is very much should be a standard now for a lot of people after all the accidents we've seen over the last decade, decade and a half. But w w was there a situation where you were like, what, what am I doing? Like, what is like, is this, is this all worth it or something you kind of share with our audience? It just. Yeah. Of... I mean, there was, there's definitely one, one incident that I was like, this sucks and I might die right now. And like, this is not the situation I wanted to put myself on. And I was up on Mount St. Elias, uh, in 2021, <clears throat> when I was up there with Nick Russell, Dan Korn, and the cinematographer, BRNA, solid. Um, <clears throat> getting off the mountain, very few people have actually skied that mountain, so there's very little information or knowledge. And we didn't get a scout flight um, to even check the lower half of the mountain, and we got dropped off a bit higher on the mountain. So when we were trying to ski down to the beach to get our pickup, because you can ski... Uh, I mean, you can ski from the summit of St. Elias, which is at 18,000 feet and ski down to the beach, which potentially is the longest ski descent in the world. Um, <clears throat> so we were we didn't summit, but we were skiing down the lower half of the mountain just to learn it because we knew we were going to come back. And we skied off this one side that we thought would go and we skied down like a 3000 foot face and then another thousand feet of glacier skiing. And then there was another 3000 foot, very steep face. And we start skiing down this couloir and it's kind of getting narrower and narrower and choking off and um, starting to get late in the afternoon because of long story of logistics of getting equipment flown off the mountain. So we don't leave stuff up there. Things were late. We were behind. There was a storm coming the very next day. By that point, once our stuff was off the mountain, we knew if we got trapped in the storm, we didn't have enough fuel, food, or the correct tents to survive that storm um, because it was a doozy. So we're skiing down. It's getting warm. We're kind of like stuck between a rock and a hard place. And we get down to the bottom of this couloir, and it's uh, a 500-foot cliff. And we're sitting there above us with a giant slope of snow that is rapidly warming up and knowing that like there is a time bomb about to go off we just don't know at what time is it going to go off in 10 seconds or we got another two hours because we knew it was that hot that the entire slope was going to go and so we started figuring out like that was the moment i'm like this fucking sucks like we all are going to die right now if we don't 
come up with the perfect solution to get ourselves out of it. Whether that's hiking back up, trying to get to a high point, which looked like an hour climb away, whether that was trying to find this other ridge line that we thought we might be able to descend down. Um, but meanwhile, we're just sitting at the bottom, like trying to figure out our plans and letting precious time tick by. We ended up climbing up this like really steep, really loose, really icy, really chossy, blocky, falling rock gully that like you could barely get a foothold in and like you'd pull on a rock and the rock would pull off and hit your leg and you'd just be like this is above the 500 foot cliff too and it would try and take your foot out and you'd be balancing just on the tip of your ski boot like one millimeter into the ice and just like this is terrifying and we got up to this ridge line after like 200 feet of like the scariest climbing i've ever done in my life um and immediately as we got to the ridge line, a coolar, like two coolars over, huge avalanche. As we're starting to send this like really exposed ridge line, but it was a safe point, the coolar next to ours, gigantic avalanche. And then as we got down to the bottom of that ridge line, I watched the single largest avalanche I've ever seen in my life, like class four, class five, like it felt like a nuclear bomb went off because the ground was shaking, go through the coolar that we just were in. Um, completely unsurvivable avalanche. And that 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 was the situation. It was like, fuck, this sucks. And I could, you know, those uh those situations, like you look back and you try and figure out the mistakes you made that led you there. And it was a lot of little mistakes, but we were also stuck between a rock and a hard place. And it was also just the reality of being on a mountain like Mount St. Elias. Like it's a, it's a burly, gnarly mountain um, that has killed plenty of people and is, is just scary. And so you have to be super, super, super on point. And we weren't, um, things are out of control, helped us lead to there. things. We, we probably could have come up with a better decision. Um, if we sat and thought for a little bit longer, but you know, in the, the hustle to try and get off the mountain, we ended up making poor decisions. And that was one moment I was really very much regretted. <laughs> but you were able to get off of the down that ridge line that, that yeah. took you to safety. Yeah, it was a and, scary it was a scary down climb. It was like loose rock shale, super exposed. You would just like put a foot down and the whole thing would like release under your foot and you're like, "Oh god." It was not it was like 2 hours of like absolutely nerve-wracking down climbing, but hey, it was it was actually except for falling to your death, it was safe, meaning no avalanches were going to come hit you. So that was the I mean, what are you point. what are you like feeling like when you're like your friend the guys like when you were there with Nick? Like are you guys just looking at each other just like, oh my God, are we like the luckiest people on earth right now? Like Yeah, a there's a ticket. There's a lot. No, you kind of it's the exact opposite. I think you're more down on yourself for being in that situation because you never want to put yourself in that situation. You obviously made mistakes to put yourself in that situation. So, um, you know, and then those other moments is like, yeah, you're super scared, but like you have no other options. So you just you have to focus, buckle down and and go and get off of it. Um, so in those regards, you're just like, everyone's not really talking too much. You're just very focused on every step you take. And, um, you know, you're, you're thinking about just like the mistakes that led you to that place and trying to figure out, like, analyze, like, okay, how do I, how do I not let this happen to me again? Yeah. You get better. And that was just a, that was basically just a scout descent. That wasn't even their full, yeah. your full on descent right but we learned a lot i will say that, <laughs> yeah, you got that we, we, out. we learned a lot um we found a couple good routes to now ski because of finding out where where to go um i named the coolar the dng coolar which is the does not go coolar so if anyone <laughs> wants to ski the dng just know that it's named for a reason um so we know not to ski that one again and then from there yeah like we did learn a lot um but it's also just like, that's part of the process. I, I tend to value getting to know mountains before just trying to go for them. I tend to value spending time with some of these burlier, more dangerous descents. Um, I think the process of learning the mountain and spending time with it and seeing its moods and seeing its like energy and trying to figure out it's like the little sneaky routes through it. Um, I, it's really important to me because 
You know, there are really dangers. You can't turn your head off. Um, you have to be on your game and listening and understanding what the mountain is doing um, because otherwise, like, you're going to put yourself in really bad positions. Um, you know, it's like the difference between surfing and and uh, and being, like, a ski mountaineer is, like, the the surfing, you know when the ocean is going to wake up. You kind of you can like forecast it exactly when it's going to wake up, when the danger is going to come in skiing. Like it's really hard to predict when the mountains are going to wake up. And that's what we're always trying to figure out. Um, the mountains are pretty dormant. They're not moving like a wave. They're just there, but all of a sudden they can wake up and they can be move and they can be really dangerous when they're moving. And so understanding those patterns, those timings, the type of snow that, needs to stick to it that needs to create safe routes all that kind of stuff is like really i think i don't know the the process i really enjoy and the process i really value in trying to do all these lines yeah part of it is just becoming kind of one with that not like not to sound cliched or anything but you just have to have that like innate sort of feel for things that have happened before it's almost why you know mountaineers get better as they get older you know most, yeah it seems like so. Yeah, no, that you can, I think, I mean, I think ski mountaineering is kind of an older man's game, older woman's game, because it takes so much experience. And mm -hmm. it just takes like, w there are a lot of observations, very like, factual, almost scientific observations you can make. But then there's this other thing of feel. And that feel is only developed through decades of experience in wild, uncontrolled mountains. And so when you're in those situations, like you're, you're drawing on a lot of that experience and a lot of that knowledge, you know, every footstep you put in to the snow, like if you've done that tens of thousands of those before, you understand what that snow is going to feel like for your skiing back down. You understand what the sun and the temperature and how they're going to affect that snow, what the winds are going to do to affect that snow. Um, you know, you're processing little information under your toes as to like, hey, this slope is going to be dangerous at two o'clock. We have to be off by two o'clock. And that only comes from experience. Yeah, I, I um as many people know, the inertia, we were born out of surf, but we cover snow really closely, we cover board mm -hmm. sports in general, um, and skiing, of course. And I think, though, that, uh, and I've said this before, that s surfing and skiing have the closest parallels just because they're the oldest. You know, they've, people have been doing these two sports for hundreds, a hundred years, you know, uh, totally. and, and there's been the media is old. Surfer bought Powder Magazine in the 70s, and that was like basically the first action sports conglomerate back in the day. So, and I've seen this pattern in both, you know, surfing and, and skiing, just to make a parallel. Because Cody, if the people didn't know, he a lot of people know this. He grew up in Santa Cruz, is, is a surfer as well. So I, I'm, I'm happy to be able to talk to you about this. But there's this pattern, you know, where surfers or skiers are kind of like park rats or they're performance surfers when they're young. They compete. They do all the things. They, they make some films. As they get older, they kind of move into like the big wave realm or in skiing's case, the mountaineering realm. You look at Seth Morse and a guy like that, you know, he was just a shredder in his younger days and just kind of kept moving, moving. Now I think he's living in Chamonix or like he's just has moved way. And then I think Shane would have done the same thing. How do you live? You know, there's a lot of guys that kind of move that way. And I think it's experience and sort of an appreciation for the power of nature. And it, do you find that parallel? Do you see that parallel that I'm talking about and kind of agree with that a little bit? 100%. Um, you know, growing, I was lucky to grow up surfing and still surf as much as I can these days. Um, and so I've been able to kind of experience both sports. And I would say like, they're the two sports that are by far the closest of all the other sports that I do. And it's mainly because there's just this like relationship with nature, and then this performance and riding aspect that comes from it. Um, and, you know, the that that kind of pattern you talk about. And it's like, I definitely, definitely see that. Um, you know, I, 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 and I, I think it because like when you're young, you're learning things and all you want to do is like in surfing, it's airs and skiing and ski the park and like a very similar and sort of that. And then as you start to kind of experience the backcountry or the bigger waves or hollower waves and, you know, like, ski mountaineering lines you start to like appreciate nature even more you start to understand like the depth of this sport and its connection to nature and you start to go into these these elements of 
more consequence being bigger waves and or bigger mountains that are human powered. And you, I don't know, you develop an appreciation for nature and you develop an appreciation for power and you're trying to like use your experience to navigate through it and do something like as as mind blowing as getting a barrel at Jaws or, you know, skiing a line off some super high peak that's incredibly high consequential. It's just kind of like, I don't know, there it's a I, I I don't understand if it's a human nature thing or if it's a sport thing. Um, but they definitely share those similarities of of surfing and skiing. Um, you know, and I will say to your old old nature, I mean like I have always thought like skiing's like the original action sport. There's 4,000 years of skiers. And then like surfing has similar elements, whether, you know, it was actually standing up on a piece of wood or, and uh, catching a wave hundreds of years ago, but even from thousands of years ago with Polynesians understanding water and waves and riding waves with kayaks and um, canoes and boats and whatnot. So there's this like connection to nature and this like almost like travel moving through different elements uh, aspect of skiing and surfing and they're like i don't know they're the they're the original action sports and i think everything else has branched out from there yeah i agree and i think with asking about that progression kind of leads into my next pr question with you you know because uh, something like the 50 project is such a huge endeavor it's like i mean i think a lot of people probably within your sport you know in your your realm too are like whoa that is a gigantic project like that's going to be tough to finish. And, and, and so then the natural thing, when you get this close, you're pretty damn close 43 out of 50. That's a, that's a lot, you know, like, so what, what comes next? You know, what do you do after you've finished a 50 Have you kind of, or even if you did, you know, come close or if you kind of have to keep working on it and chipping away at it, what, what kind of comes next for you? I have no idea. Um, you know, like <laughs> I can, you know, I've had like, two major career changes within the sport as a skier already being, you know, an aspiring ski racer in my teens and into early twenties of trying to make like, you know, the Olympic downhill team and whatnot to then quitting that and moving into free ride skiing and big mountain skiing and skiing and ski films and doing that for a decade plus, and then kind of stopping that and moving into this. And like those changes all came like from a kind of deeply personal place. It was just a place where I was like, not really enjoying this aspect, but that aspect over there looks really cool. Um, so for ski mountaineering and like kind of what I'm doing, like, I don't know how I'm going to feel in the next couple of years. I do know I'm like, I'm still inspired by these human powered ski, human powered skiing, um, going for challenging lines, also going for just like incredible ski lines that aren't super dangerous or anything, but just like mm -hmm. ripping in the backcountry. Um, that hasn't waned. So I would imagine something like that is going to continue. Um, but if it's like, could be in a different realm than the 50 itself. And, and for the 50, like, you know, whether I finish or not, like, yeah, it's a goal. I would like to finish, but if I don't like before, before I launched the project. So I had had this idea for it in like 2016. Um, I didn't launch the project publicly until 2019. And in that time frame, I did a lot of things like go to Denali and go on an expedition for my first kind of high altitude expedition and see if I enjoyed it. I went with some friends. It was an amazing trip. I went to the Himalaya. I did like another kind of exploratory trip in Northern BC with some friends. And I just kind of was like feeling out what's out there. Um, and then when I started having the idea and it started being like, yeah, like these lines, the, the lines in the book are really drawing me. I would love to try and ski some of them. And when I came up with it, I was like, well, I should probably just try and ski all of them. Like I honestly sat on that idea of like skiing all of them for like two years and really wrestled personally with like the fact that, you know, the likelihood is you're not going to finish. Why has no one actually ever done this before? Is what you're going into incredibly dangerous as you're getting in your older age, as you've figured, you know, seen a lot of your heroes die? And does this conflict with that number one rule, which is don't die? Um, I wrestled with that a lot. I thought about it a ton. And like my ultimate conclusion before I launched it was that like I would kind of stay up at night and think about it and be like, are you going to be comfortable for the rest of your life? People asking you, why didn't you finish the 50? And it wasn't until that I became really comfortable. So I was like, yeah, 
I, that's going to be such a personal decision. And only I'm the only person that is going to know why I didn't finish. Um, if I don't finish, then if people are asking me that, then like, if I'm comfortable with who I am, I'm comfortable with like all the experience that led up to that. That was what got me over the edge to be like, cool, we're going for this. And we're going to like publicly announce this because, you know, <clears throat> that like, it's ironic that I named it the 50 when it was this project and like, and trying to ski all 50 lines when to me, like before I launched it, I was like very explicit of being like, I am very comfortable with not finishing all 50. Mm -hmm. So whether I do or not, like, again, I'm going to try, um, you know, I, keep trying on lines that I've tried before. I have uh, more trips planned throughout the rest of the season to keep trying on some of these lines. Um, I, you know, for the next decade, I could have one holding me up. And if I'm at the base of that mountain multiple times and being like, no, this is still on my list, not because I want to finish the 50, but because I want to do this line, um, then I'm probably going to finish it. It'll just take a long time. And that's how I want to do it. Um, because again, um, my goal is like, my goals are different as we've kind of stated. I I say it in the project often. I was like, I have three goals with this. And number one priority is don't die. Number two priority is have fun. Number three priority is ski the 50. And so like, I, I don't know like what that outcome is going to be, um, but I'm going to keep trying while I'm still motivated. Yeah. I mean, I couldn't imagine how much of a soul searching thing this would be just, mm -hmm. just because of all the questions that arise because you're dealing with obviously mother nature first and foremost, logistics, family, like just makes you question yourself. I'm sure constantly. Totally. I always actually say one of the best uh, tools of a ski mountaineer is self-awareness. Um, we think of ski mountaineering quite often as something that once you get ice axes out, crampons on your feet and ropes in your hand, now you're ski mountaineering. But to me, like you can le learn a lot of that stuff in a couple of days. What like defines to me what are good ski mountaineers or the decisions they make. And a lot of that comes back to self-awareness. And I have to do that a lot with this own project of being like, oh, did you just drive a thousand miles? And is that influencing your decision to keep going today? Um, try to erase that context from your brain because you need mm -hmm. to make the decision in this moment right now with no external pressures that you can put on yourself to finish it. Um, did I just spend a lot of money to get here? Did I just waste a week away from my family to get here? Um, have I been on a roll lately and just like feeling really confident, you know, those kind of things, like having that self-awareness, I think is really, really important. So I do, I'm like kind of always questioning myself. Um, I do quite often a mental check-in while out on a trip, while out starting a ski tour of being like, all right, what's happened in the last week? What's happened in the last uh, month? What's happened in this last year? Do Are you overconfident? Are you feeling pressure from any way? Are you kind of check in with yourself to see kind of who is making the decisions for you, whether that's the rational observ uh, observational part of you, or is it like the emotional contextual part of you? So um, that's, again, one of the kind of things I, I do enjoy about this project and um, figuring out, like just learning about myself, learning about moving through mountains from really amazing people and learning about the mountains themselves while being in them. Yeah, this is like... The ultimate Zen trip for sure. But, um, I, I, I guess, you know, I, I kind of touched on where you're going next and you, I mean, you can't really, that's the head trip about the thing is like, you can't really leave the 50 behind. It's kind of part of, it's become part of you. And I mean, I would ask, you know, cause your, your wife is working on a ski movie. You've done some, like some incredibly influential stuff with days of my youth, you know, um, I, I wonder though, like, you know, again, we'll go back to surfing the same thing that ski movie has kind of been, uh, it's just like the surf movie has been kind of, th they've been hurt a lot, you know, I mean, we're not going to have a Warren Miller movie this year. And I mean, you built this YouTube thing, but at the behest maybe of ski movies, you know, you, you have this, this, you could vlog now basically forever. Like you have your own ski movie uh, production kind of distribution channel right now does that is there still a place for ski movies or would you do you see yourself because you're kind of like the crux of this you've you've experienced all this 
and I would like when I to connect this to what we just said, it's like wondering what your next move is. It's like, you know, I would think probably you might do another film or could do another film with all the footage you you have. But are ski movies still viable? Is there still a place for them? You know, and especially since with your experience, you know this subject so well. You know, you've seen this probably happen in surfing as a fan. You're now basically a vlogger, like a la Nathan Florence and that that crew. You know, it's it's the same thing. Where are we with the, the ski film, which was so important for so long in skiing? Yeah, it's. Uh, I sure as hell hope ski movies don't go away because there's nothing better than going to a ski movie premiere in the fall as the temps are starting to drop, as you're starting to get a little bit of snow kind of up on the high peaks and feeling that energy and stoke of, you know, hundreds of people and friends crowding into a theater, all slurping beers and just getting whole hyped. And then the ski movie comes on and you just feel so energized by it and so excited for winter. I mean, that's what I grew up on. It's fucking amazing. It's such a good feeling. And I don't think that's ever going to go away personally because it's such a tradition and that feeling you can't replicate by watching YouTube, by scrolling social media. Sure. Like maybe different business models are having to be taken. Um, maybe different ways of like funding these films. Maybe there's less people, but maybe it's more important people. I don't know, but I don't think it's actually going to go away because of that feeling you get at a ski movie premiere is like, it's unreplaceable. Um, when it comes into, you know, the vlog and the, like the social media stuff, it's actually funny because when I started the 50, as I've talked about, I kind of had the idea before I had like a media side of it. I was like, Oh, I'll try and ski all 50. And I was like, how do I do this? and be a professional skier, keep my career going. And I, you know, my first idea was like, you make a movie about it. And I'm like, well, <laughs> I might just have to disappear for like six years. And then who knows, I won't finish. And then what's that movie? And I actually took a lot of inspiration from the surf world. And I looked at like three different things and I had three kind of, kind of observations about the world of media. And I was like, well, people say they don't want have enough time to watch movies, but they love serials. So like, they'll watch 12 hours of Game of Thrones, but like they say they won't watch a two hour movie or so what's going on there. And it's like, well, there's this feeling of a connection to characters and learning and going on the travels with them. So I looked at that. I was like, well, maybe this has to be a series. And then the second part was like, what's the media platform that's like doing well? And it was like, I was not on YouTube at all, but I saw that YouTube is like the only platform that wasn't shrinking. Like, Instagram shrinks, Facebook shrinking, Twitter shrinking. They're all kind of just losing their kind of cultural relevancy, even though tons of people are on them all the time. Um, but YouTube was a really powerful platform. So I was like, well, it's got to be on YouTube. And then the third thing was I was like, vlogs are really popular. I don't watch any of them, but I'm like, Jamie O'Brien, it seems like he's killing it with mm -hmm. vlogs. And I would like watch a few of them. And then I like, yeah, I stumbled on like uh, Koa Rothman's and Nathan Florence's. And I was like, Hmm, there's something there. The surfers are doing this right. Um, maybe that's what I kind of do. And I combine those three ideas together to be like, all right, that's kind of what the 50 is going to look like. Um, um, even though like, again, vlogs, I don't really watch them. I don't really get it, but I think there's a seed of truth there. Like this, like connection to a character and just kind of reality focus. Like in a certain way, it's like the new reality TV in a certain way, I would say. Um, but like, for one person that you somehow get attached to. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And maybe that's where the movies live in a sequel in, in, you know, in an, in, a, in another world, you know, that's where they're kind of, they're released that way. And maybe they are just seg the segments are released on their own, you know? Um, I yeah. don't know. I well, know. I mean, the other thing the, the what we're seeing now too, is the dawn of these like behind the scenes sports documentaries. So from, yeah. Uh, Netflix's Drive to Survive to Full Swing, the golf one. And then there's uh, one about tennis as well. They're just like, those are blowing up. What I think it's really showing is that people want to get to know these people that they see on TV, these people they see in major media imagery. And so like getting to know people. And I think like, that's what a kind of vlog sort of does. And I think that's what the 50 and why it's been successful is like, I think people feel like they, they know me because 
they're spending a lot of time with me if they're watching yeah. all the episodes. <laughs> There's a lot of hours of content out there. So, um, so yeah, I think that's kind of part of the success of it is just that's this connection to a character that you start to understand and see what makes them tick. Do you see a movie coming out of this? Out of the uh, I have a couple of, yeah, there's one or two things that are in the works behind the scenes that I've been working on for like a year or two that will be the summation of this project. Um, so whether that's a, a movie or a docu-series that kind of wraps it all up, um, goes a little bit more in depth into it, something like that. Um, yeah, that's kind of the goal at some point. When that comes, I don't know. Um, I will say that like, you know, the the episodes at some point, they're going to have to end because there's just not enough of them to kind of sustain. Um, I do have ideas that I think I'm going to follow through with on next year. Um, but then, you know, as I, mean, I do want to wrap this story up in some sort of way, and it's probably going to be with a movie or kind of if there's just way too much footage, a docuseries, if the story's good enough. But um, working with different production companies and directors on kind of exploring some of those ideas. Rad. Well, that's uh, something that I'm sure everybody would love to see. I mean, I, I would as a fan of what your of your work. It's been really cool to watch, and I'm really happy that you sat down with us. I appreciate it. I know how busy you are, and this is going to be your busy season coming in, so I don't want to keep you too long, but uh, I do want to ask you, we kind of ask people this, you know, in a lot of our interviews as we leave, you know, I, I, I and I know this has probably changed for you over the years, but now you have a, a good perspective on it. Could you maybe tell us what your key to happiness is these days? Hmm. I, yeah, that's a tough one because I feel like I'm like, I'm a pretty naturally content person in general. I've just always been kind of on the happy end of things, like just simple things make me happy. Um, like I actually thought about it last night of like just how happy I get with a good cup of coffee in the morning. And it's so simple. And I don't know if that's just being like old and, you know, you start <laughs> to understand these little things in life can make you so happy. Um, but like for me, like... What I've really, I think, truly like grounds you and makes you happy is a sense of community and having like a family and real friends and a real community around you to me is the thing that like, I don't know, like we have barbecues with your friends and just like that, the kind of like contentment that comes from that. And that to me just comes from being a good uh, being a good person. And that has nothing to do with successes that you have in life. Um, you know, it has nothing to do with things on the exterior. It's just kind of like being content and having the building that good community. Um, you know, it's probably oversimplifying it. And there's probably a lot more things and there's probably a lot of other reasons why what makes people happy. But I will say like, I've been lucky to have a lot of success in my career. And I'd lie to you if I didn't say that this is like, you know, those achieving those goals made me feel good. But at the same time, I noticed how fleeting they were. Like as soon as you win the award, as soon as like the thing goes viral a few months later, like that stuff's gone. And if if you can't find contentment in the process, if you can't find contentment in being there with your friends, with your family, with your community, if you can't find contentment of being in the mountains and working your way towards that goal and doing that goal without anyone ever finding out about it, then you'll never truly be happy because, um, yeah, like I just, at this point in my career, having gone through so much with it, like, I just know, like, trying to put my name at the top of a list, like it's very fleeting and trying to like prove to the world how great I am. Like that's like, I think the worst way of going about things. I actually think that uh, like ends up making the exact opposite thing happen. I tend to find those people tend to struggle within themselves. Um, those ones that are trying to prove how great they are. So um, I don't know. That was my rambling kind of little thing no, about it. That. Yeah. Communities, community, man. It's almost barbecue season two, finally. Totally. So I love, I love that. I love. I, I do. I mean, people. like, it's funny. Like, even you know, I've got a great community up here, but when I go back to like Santa Cruz and you hang out on the cliff and I see friends that I grew up surfing with, and it's just like, there's something really special about just going out and going surfing with your friends and paddling out, and you know, like eight of the 
15 people out there and you're just chatting and sharing good waves and you like those sessions end up being so more valuable than like the best barrel you ever got in your life. Like the just kind of general day-to-day contentment that you get of being with your friends, going out and enjoying the days I, I find is like kind of the key that has made at least me happy since I'm speaking for myself. Yeah. You have any surf trips planned for the summer? I do. As soon as we are done with the winter, just going down to Baja for a quick one. Um, we always kind of, it's an easy, quick one. Um, went down to El Salvador last year, hoping to go back there. Um, the like, I really want to go back to the men- Mentawise, but traveling with a infant to the Mentawise, it's a long way to go. So we're delaying that for a few years. We did it right before we ended up having a kid. I'm very thankful for that. But uh, yeah, and then just beat it back down in Santa Cruz. Um, I've got a little studio that I'm renting out down there. So I have a place and all my boards are down there. So hopefully once uh, my winter is over, which my winter will be over in summer, pretty much at the end of June, um, then I'll be hopefully just kind of in the water somewhere. Awesome, Cody. It's always good to talk to you, man. I'm, thanks, I'm really a, a fan of your work. I appreciate you taking time. No, thanks for reaching out. Um, yeah, you definitely. It took me a couple of weeks to get back to you because I've been on the road for the last couple of weeks, but I'm glad uh, we found a little bit of time before the next trip. All good. And um, I'll look for an update again so we can know what you're doing for next winter. So cool. thanks a lot, Cody. Thanks, Joe. Appreciate it. All right. See you, buddy. See ya.